It's uh, five past 12 and we can uh, start this webinar today about knowing youth. And I will give immediately the floor to our director, Alexis Guzdil, for his uh, opening remarks. Thank you very much, Alexis. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Marika. Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon for those who are uh, not uh, in the same time uh, uh, time zone than Portugal. I'm very delighted to, to open this 19th uh, EMCDD webinar. I cannot believe that uh, in less than two years we already had the 19 webinars. And thank you all of you, of course, for following us and joining us, uh, both as speakers or participants, and also uh, more broadly for your participation and your questions. Uh, for me, this uh, topic of, uh, today is a very important and very timely topic because uh, knowing youth uh, and, and making or building digital platforms for decision uh, making is uh, at the heart of the current, but also the future new business model of the MCDDA that has been adopted by our management board last December and that uh, we are now going to implement over the next three to five years. Um, I, th I think the uh, first we have uh, uh, fantastic speakers that have been invited today. I'm always delighted to see that uh, uh, we managed to get fantastic and very good speakers, and that uh, uh, we it illustrates once more one of the characteristics of EMCDD webinars is that uh, it's not EMCDD pretending to speak to everybody. On the contrary, we, we invite, we give the floor to the experts, to the partners, uh, and uh, we, we invite them we, through giving them more and better visibility. I think it's an indirect but very useful way to give more visibility to what we try to achieve together. And today we have a very, uh, very interesting speakers. The first of them, of course, is very special and dear to us. It's uh, Sabrina Molinaro. She's the... Uh, the, the ESPAD coordinator, uh, you know how important ESPAD uh, school surveys are uh, for us in the European Union. It, uh, it illustrates also a, a special but very good and fruitful partnership that we have with the ESPAD uh, and that we are going to further develop uh, in the coming years. And, uh, and I think the, the move that was initiated by Sabrina and her colleagues with the support of the National Research Center Council in Italy uh, uh, to make available uh, more easily the SPAD data is extremely useful and important. And of course, we, we fully support this initiative. Uh, Sabrina also has a, uh, another specific objective is, uh, is to make better use of the data, the mine, the gold mine of information that is contained by SPAD. And uh, she certainly knows that she has a very st strong ally for that purpose with, uh, with the MCDD and with me as the director. Margida, Margarida Gaspar de Matos um, uh, from the University, for the Faculty of Medicine, the University of Lisbon uh, is well known to us. She's also a member of our scientific committee. And uh, we, we were together attending another conference and another presentation a few weeks ago. Um, uh, I think uh, she, she has a very good and very dynamic way to present the data, but also the questions around the data. And I, I would like to add that something we sometimes forget in the drugs field, at least we forgot sometimes in the past, is that uh, the, the statistics are supposed to help us to answer to questions. And, uh, and uh, there is sometimes a tendency to start first collecting data and then trying to find what are the questions. Luckily, we have Margarida with us to, to show us and share with us uh, what is the right way to do the things. And, uh, and I think the same, uh, we can say the same about Stephanie and Christian. Um, I think uh, the, the, the public health, health education, but also the question of uh, evaluation are very important to us. Um, so why is it so relevant and so timely? It's also because uh, we are going to launch the, in two weeks' time the next edition of the European Drug Report, and that uh, uh, the, the, the overall trend can be summarized in three words, which is everywhere, everything, and everyone. Uh, drugs are everywhere, and they've never been so potent, so pure, and so cheap in Europe. 
uh, everything can be a drug, uh, which means uh, be, it goes much beyond the distinction between licit or illicit uh, drugs of vegetal origin or synthetic or chemical origin, uh, drugs or products that have been produced with a purpose uh, or without specific purpose linked to human consumption, use or abuse. Uh, but that can be the object of, a, of, a, of an addiction or an addictive behavior. And uh, why is this important? Because this shows that uh, there is an urgent need to update the image, the vision that we have of what are people who are using, who are the people who are using drugs today. Basically, people who can have a, a, an addictive, present an addictive behavior, there are much more people than just the profile, the classical profile of people injecting heroin. So if we don't update this profile, this image we have, there is no way we can conduct or adapt prevention strategies and prevention programs. So this is why it's important. And the youth, of course, is uh, even more important in that context. First, because they are even more exposed, given their age um, and the adolescents, uh, uh, they are in some cases more exposed to the possibility to, to develop some of those uh, behaviors. Um, again, uh, a lot of people can be in contact or have a show uh, an addictive behavior that does not correspond to the more classic image of the junkie injecting heroin, which means you can have people who are uh, having or uh, ready to present an addictive behavior without being conscious of it. And certainly some of the consequences of this huge availability and also the huge potency, if you look at the potency of cannabis, the potency in THC has doubled over the last 10 years. Uh, which means that the potential risk for ads are even more important than before. But it's not only about cannabis or about heroin. So we need to update uh, the vision and the programs for, for, for prevention. And therefore, this is, this is why we need school surveys. We need good school surveys. We need repeated, per periodically repeated uh, good school surveys. And, and I think uh, the, the work of, uh, of uh, ESPAT in that context is uh, extremely important. That's an important tool. Um, it's also very important. I already uh, mentioned that we really support and welcome uh, the, the, the aim of uh, SPAD to make those data more available to everybody who may, uh, may be able to make use of those data. Uh, and then we need also to make sure that the decision makers are using those information. So it's one more reason to uh, for me to, to extremely supportive and proud that the MCDDA is organizing such a webinar with uh, those so good speakers. Uh, there, is a, there are two additional points I would like to mention is because when we speak about digital platforms for decision making, of course, it's the, the, the new digital world and the digital transformation. It offers also new ways and new paths for communication, for entering into in contact and in relation with people, especially with the youth except a small detail is that uh, if you are 25 years old, you are already looking very old for the young people who are exposed to any kind of substance use, which means that uh, we need to be aware that uh, we need to involve and to associate uh, uh, young and youth. Uh, we need more co-production, but we first of all need to make better use and implement more frequently those, those surveys. And then there is a, a last point for, that for me is, uh, is both a potential uh, but can be a risk is the fact that um, more and more people talk about uh, evidence-based and scientific-based evaluation. But honestly, there is a lot of fantasy around that. And, uh, and the last time I heard a, a comment that was not looking scientific at all, even if it was using uh, many times the, the, the terms uh, scientific evidence, is about the evaluation of those programs. And, and this is why uh, I was making reference to the work of uh, Christian Stock and Stephanie Helmer and the colleagues and other people working on the evaluation of uh, prevention programs in Europe. Is, uh, is I think there is a, a broad kind of a fantasy about what are the results we can reasonably expect from prevention programs. And certainly uh, a comment that I hear sometimes uh, is that uh, there is sometimes a negative opinion about some programs or some innovative programs 
because we cannot prove that people have changed dramatically their behavior after a first contact or first preventive action. And, and, and I think this is exactly opposite to what is a scientific or evidence-based work. Nobody can pretend to be a prophet, uh, uh, which means that nobody can pretend that when we speak once to someone, she or he is going to change her or his behavior completely forever for the entire life. It just don't exist. That's not the objective of prevention. So to have a better knowledge of the behaviors, of the perceptions, and of the attitudes of the youth through the, the, the ESPAD survey or other school surveys, it's extremely important that we use this information. We try to better understand what it means to be a teenager, an adolescent in today's world, in today's European Union, and then to try to build a preventive action that try to build on this knowledge, that try to address some of the challenges, but are not limiting themselves with some pseudo performance indicators that, uh, that are not appropriate, that are not realistic, and that ultimately are not scientific. So uh, having said that, uh, I wish you a very good webinar. I'm staying with you until the end of this meeting, and I'm looking forward to listen to our speakers and to listen to your questions. Alexis, thank you very much for your always inspiring words and for your dedication to our work. The chair of this session is uh, Joao Matias. I would uh, give the floor to Joao and I switch off my camera. Thank you very much. Have an excellent webinar. I will be behind the scenes to support. Joao. Thank you, Marika and Alexis for the introduction. And good morning and good afternoon. I think Alexis uh, made my life much easier with a uh, with, uh, very good introduction and also introducing uh, a bit the speakers who I want to really thank for accepting the, the challenge to, to present uh, on this topic. I also would like to thank uh, my colleague Alessandra Bo for the help of setting up and organizing this webinar. Our objective with this webinar is mostly to explore and a bit understand what uh, the potential we have with, uh, with the data from youth surveys and all the studies around young people and how they can uh, better inform uh, drug policies and uh, public health uh, policies. So I think the, the four speakers we have today will provide a good uh, input on, uh, around this topic. Alexis already mentioned briefly, we have with us Sabrina Molinaro, that is the SPAT coordinator, a long-term collaborator working for the National Research Council in Italy, we have Margarita gaspar um, part of the EMCDA Scientific Committee and professor in the, the Faculdade de Medicina from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Stephanie Helmer, researcher on evidence-based public health in the University of Bremen, Germany. And Christian Stock, professor in public health and health education in Charité in Berlin, Germany. We would go straight to the questions we would uh, ask our uh, speakers to talk to us and, and try to answer. So we will start with a question to Margarita Gspard March. So what do we know about young people uh, today and how data can inform decision making? So Margarita, please, the, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank um, especially Alexis and Joan for the, the close uh, work together. Um, I will not present data today. Uh, I will uh, reflect upon uh, how is it to be young, and then I will uh, just pitch some of our research to try to make a link uh, from research to action, to inspire action, and then public policies. It's perhaps too quick, but I will be available uh, if by email whenever you need. So that's me, uh, easy, and uh, it's already done. And then um, talking about Generation Z, okay, we will, but uh, be careful because it's not so clear what a generation really is. And that's, that will be the first question. What is an, a generation? 
you have uh, a way of, of looking to generation, which is periods of times where people are supposed to uh, share common events, life events, historical events, and uh, we can be baby boomer, generation X, and so forth. That's a way of looking to generations. And uh, you have a lot of uh, Google things about uh, the evolution of generation. Now we have already the generation alpha, which are the, the younger adolescents. You, you have also uh, another way to look to the generation, which is how is it to be 18 or, or 80 or 60 or whatever. And note that everybody who is older than 18 has already been 18 before. And so that's a, a status that we acquire and we keep for, for a lifetime. And so that is how is it to be 18, but in the 40s, in the 70s, and the millennials. And they were once all 18, not any longer. So question two, what part of the world are we talking about? Is it Europe? Because it's not. And when we talk about Generation Z, we see this. Uh, you, can you see my mouse moving? And you see this, but in other parts of the world, right now, other kind of Generation Z are, uh, are possible and be careful with that. And question three, are we all male, young, attractive, white, middle-class, educated, sophisticated and healthy? I mean, this guy from the other picture, only the men, white men, educated white men are Generation Z, be careful. They are all immersed in biased visions. And whatever I say from now on, uh, keep this in mind. We are all biased. And so that's the Generation Z. And of course, they have the war at the corner, an economical recession, uh, COVID and lockdowns and uh, all kind of things. And I will just pitch you a little bit and, uh, and link you to the action. So what we know already, in empirical study, from research to action, from action to public policies, from public policy to further action, further action, further research. And that is a circle, a never ending story. But it, it has to be like that. Whenever you say it's like that, the question changed and you are wrong again. And so don't be sure ever. This is a, a very easy way to uh, present population health surveys with age. In general, things get worse. Things are still different uh, according to genders, but yet worse with age, either with girls or with boys. With socioeconomical problems, everything gets worse. We know that. Also in Portugal, for instance, we had a terrible period here in 2002, and then we have a good period here in 2008, and that was, this is our life, uh, concerning adolescents' health. Everything that is good was worse in 2002, better till 2008, uh, and then decreasing again. When we compare Portugal with Europe, the, the red is Europe, some things are better, some things are worse. I will not say what, why, but you can, you can see in the platforms. That's why it's so fantastic to have access to that. And when we try to model, we have consequences and determinants. And uh, we have that, that kind of models that academics know perfectly and the journalists hate it and the professionals as well. Uh, that means that school, for instance, concerning adolescents and adolescents' well-being, school and family and friends are relevant scenarios. And when well-being is guaranteed, everything gets better whatever well-being is. And so uh, what is that useful for besides looking bizarre? It look, it's, uh, it's okay for, for thinking action. And uh, sorry. And so how uh, we know now that we have now manuals, we have online quiz, we have ways to promote uh, health and well-being in schools. Uh, we have... Uh, 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 evidence to say that young people ha have to have active engagement in uh, promotive actions in school. And uh, we have that, we have uh, platforms, we have uh, booklets that you can download from here. 
in Portuguese, unfortunately, most of them. And uh, these are booklets that teachers can use about different topics of adolescent health. We did that from uh, research and from data uh, so that we can translate the data into something useful for professionals. Okay, again, uh, I'm having problems because I put our faces in a way that I cannot see the text. But this is a study we did with, with um, university students. First, a year in the university during COVID already. And we inquire a lot of things. I will not talk about that, but I will talk only about uh, the effects of COVID. And we see that substance use was actually decreasing during the lockdown times. Uh, online games uh, are uh, increasing, but excessive screen time increased tremendously. And so we have an issue and call for action. Let's talk to them. And we did qualitative research. And I will not read that, but they told us that they are drinking less, they are, they are smoking less cannabis because they, they take medicine and they take prescribed medicine. And they are afraid because they think that now that we are not locked down anymore, uh, substance use can increase tremendously in the next couple of uh, months, years. But it's their fear, not mine. Those are codes from uh, uh, young people, not adolescents. Uh, yes, adolescents, perhaps. First, first year in the university. And so also they say that, yes, screen time is their life uh, and actually very useful. Otherwise, during lockdown, they will not be able to work. And they have ideas about what can be done. Tell us what to do, not only what not to do. We need alternatives. What can we do to manage emo emotions, to, to have fun, to live a life? And that was that those are the promotive questions. And so uh, moving research into action, we have a lot of um, resources now, especially uh, a collaboration with the National Erasmus agency uh, and also an, on, uh, we intend to, to build a platform identifying good practices in university settings. So also we did, um, and that specific uh, um, work was done with, um, with Generation Z, but also their parents and their grandparents. And we want to set a scenario intergeneration, not to have that, uh, that uh, um, you know that split between uh, uh, the old ones, the young ones, and we want like that. And um, we promote a dialogue among uh, generations, and it came up the need for sustainable intergenerational solutions. That is the worst word to say in English: intergenerational. So uh, I mean, we have to solve problems, but in a way that the next generation is not getting worse problems. And so we have now a public intergenerational debate, a national future dialogue. And I will go to Bogota in a couple of um, weeks for a World Leadership Congress about uh, how to put generation talking to each other. Okay, uh, we did another survey with students uh, uh, from a municipality. Uh, I will not tell you all the thing, but only the mental thing and the COVID and the results. Girls more frequently uh, sad and depressed and anxious and the young people better than old people. The same thing that in national studies. So age is a risk factor, being a female is a risk factor and COVID provoke another bad context. What shall we do now? The, the beginning actions from the municipalities, because uh, if municipalities can, of course we need national service and we need European level service, but then the municipality has to be able to pick up uh, idiosyncratic issues there so that they can what uh, promote actions and uh, public policies. Okay, and that was the last one. It was actually, it's being delivered 
today uh, to, to, my, to our, our country, to Portugal. And this is a survey that we did after, uh, after seeing that uh, mental health was, uh, mental health uh, issues were increasing with, with COVID. And we did, uh, this is Portugal, and we did uh, a national survey on mental health and the psychological health for peoples and for students. And we did that with the Ministry of Education. And actually the results are that uh, one every three people have any sign of psychological distress and one every two teachers have an issue. Also uh, the region thing is not very important for you but we, we, we could pick up uh, regional differences, age difference and gender difference. And what, do we need that for? To enforce public policies. And now the Ministry of Education has a strong commitment to the country and to ourselves uh, to, uh, to, take, to, to engage in a lot of measure from now on in the, sex, in the next six months. So that is uh, about Alex was, was talking about prevention and promoting, and that is a nice picture of it. So we can prevent, it's nice, we can protect, we can promote, and we can lead people to participate. But that is from people point of view. But we also need public policies and friendly environment. And so uh, the sea has the affordance of allowing a bus. And we, can, we have to see the environment like affordance, like opportunities. And we have to be able to pick up the opportunities of the environment. And so for me, if you allowed me the metaphor of the wave, this is um, a metaphor for what I think about prevention and promotion. And this is us, the, and that's our thanks in KR and my email, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magadita, for the very thought-provoking presentation. I think it was a very good introduction to what comes also next. And uh, a lot of questions came to my mind. I forgot to mention, for those uh, watching online, hello, first. And second, if you have questions, please do write them in the Q&A uh, section in your screen or in the chat so that after the four speakers talk, we will go through the questions and ask uh, them to, to the speakers. I would now move to the second question of this morning to Sabrina Molinaro. And, um, and I'm very happy because today we are launching the ESPA data portal. Sabrina will talk about it today. It has been a long process, but I'm very happy it's out and uh, out there and people can explore it. So we, Sabrina will be presenting the ESPA data tool, which allows access to 20 years of ESPA data on substance use amongst 15 to 16 year old uh, adult students, adolescents. So Sabrina, please, the, the floor is yours. And I will um, share a video as soon as you tell me. Okay. Hey, Sabrina. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for uh, the presentation. And thank you, um, CBDA, for the invitation. And uh, also uh, thank uh, to Alexis uh, for the beautiful uh, introduction. Um, I'm... I'm very happy because today is a, uh, is a big day for the ASPAD community. As Joao said, this is the, the, the final treasure of a big uh, work uh, started more than 10 years ago together with the MCDDA. Because before to be able to develop this portal, we needed to develop the ASPAD trend databases. That is a, a really great uh, uh, big database uh, with all data uh, inside. So uh, finally, from today, our project uh, will open its data not only to the scientific community, but uh, also to all the stakeholders who will be able to use 
all the information of ASPA. That's the real news because uh, inside the database, uh, there are many, many information that normally are not showed in the report or in the, um, in, in the normal communication. What does it mean? That from today, you will be able to have access to all the information inside the, uh, the, 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 the questionnaire. We uh, develop uh, this, uh, the, this portal thinking three different profile of users. People who want to take a look for general information, people who want to take a look inside some specific information, and for expert users. Uh, to be honest, I have to tell you that uh, all the micro data of ESPAD has uh, uh, already um, used from the, uh, the, the, the scientific community by another portal that uh, you just need to ask for this kind of uh, uh, micro data and you can have access to them. So let me uh, just show you some, uh, some preliminary information just to recap you uh, what is important to know about uh, HESPAD. I know already of you, uh, all of you already know uh, what is HESPAD, European School Survey on Alcohol and Other Drugs. And uh, uh, our objective, I'm the HESPAD coordinator since uh, uh, 2016. And with, my, um, with our research group, we put together a, a lot of uh, stuff in order to collect uh, much more cross-national uh, representative uh, data and to advance the scientific knowledge on uh, adolescent substance use and to investigate all the new addictive behaviors because right now ASPAD not only taking account information about uh, um, illegal substance use and uh, other psychoactive substance Use, but also about gambling, gaming, and other risk behavior. And uh, we, uh, with the aim also to support evidence based policy and uh, to expand as much as possible the research network uh, of international collaborators. So, if you are a researcher from a country that is not already part of the ASPAD project, please contact us because here you have a picture of. Uh, uh, all the country that uh, during the time uh, collaborated with our study is a big, big number of country, but uh, we, uh, we missed some of you. So we would like to uh, um, enlarge our partnership. Uh, we are looking for some partner from UK, for example. And uh, here you can see how many students participated in the uh, surveys uh, from 1995 to 2019. So we have more than 600,000 uh, questionnaires from um, students collected in this uh, big database. And our commitment, of course, is to enlarge the project network and to develop innovative data collection method. We are trying to uh, push our uh, collaborator in ASPAD uh, to move, uh, to switch from the paper and pencil collection to the web administrated collection. Hopefully in the future we will be able to do that. So it will be much faster. And uh, uh, to improve the access for research and all the stakeholders uh, and uh, the exploration from the general public uh, in the data. So. From today, the uh, ESPA data uh, will be not only a report, that is a beautiful report, it's fantastic, and you have to read it. Uh, inside the, the report, we have a lot of information, and we have also all the additional table that you can look for, but is uh, also a portal, a data portal. Now, uh, Joao, please uh, send the, um, the, 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 the video. Uh, and then I will show you in the part of the project. Can you see it now? <clears throat> Ciao, I'm Sabrina Molinaro, ESPAD coordinator. ESPAD, the European School Survey on Alcohol and Other Drugs, is a collaborative study that involves more than 40 countries in the European area. ESPAD collects data since 1995 
among uh, 16 years old uh, student about alcohol use, drug use and other risk behaviors. As a further develop of ESPAD project, we put together all data from seven waves of ESPAD data collection. That means that now we have this huge trend database that include more than 20 years data collection. This exceptional treasure is now available for open data consultation. Wherever you are a journalist, a student or a teacher, you can freely join the portal data.espad.org. It's my pleasure to introduce you the coordination team. I'm Sonia Cerrai, I'm the communication manager. I'm Elisa Benedetti, the project manager. And now enjoy the Trend Data Portal. In the ESPA Data Portal, you can find an interactive map in which you can select substances and the main parameters to see the related results. Trend data are also available for the main substances and indicators. If you are interested in a particular topic, you can select it or digit a keyword. All the questions available in the ESPAD questionnaires will appear. Then you can refine your search. In case you need to deepen the analysis, you can use the advanced search that will be available after registration. Enter a keyword, select the indicators, and the data will be visualized in the bottom chart, which you can adapt to your needs. You might be interested in comparing results from specific countries and again, choose how to visualize them. You can also choose another indicator and select all the available years to obtain a trend and a specific chart. And what if you wish to compare substances and stratify by gender? You will be able to download the charts or save your search in your personal account. So, thank you. Thank you, Joao. And I think it is a, it, it's a little late, so I'm going to, to, to show you quickly some, uh, some part of the website just to, to, to let you know as simple it is to go through the uh, data portal. As you see inside uh, the data portal, you can have the first level that, that is a, a very, very uh, simple to look at. So you will find all the information regarding the seven wave of uh, ESPAD, but you also have the possibility to have some maps with some indicator. Uh, for example, uh, we can choose whatever you like, uh, heroin, that is uh, something uh, uh, interesting, all the information update uh, when you choose the indicator, and you can also uh, take a look at different uh, wave and the data from different wave. Inside, you have all the information for each country. Of course, you can also go uh, and see exactly what is going on in that country. But not, uh, uh, not only this, in the first level, you can also uh, take a look to the trend data. So you have all the information for all the country that collect the data uh, in ASPAD. For example, here we can choose the Greece. And of course, um, you can uh, see all the data from all the wave where uh, the country collected and the uh, indicator that we put in, and you can split the uh, graph by gender. You have in this part also this interesting uh, section about some topics. Inside uh, you will find all the uh, information, uh, all the uh, publication, peer reference publication about some specific topic, and it's something that you can consult. So it's very general, but is a uh, full of information. Then, of course, you can uh, move to the second level, and the second level is a little bit more um, complicated, but not so much. So, for example, I asked for a risk, and here you uh, we found 
for the result matching with the term risk. And inside you, as you can see, you find all the item of the SPAD where the, the word risk is in. For example, here you have um, all the data from the 2019, 100,000 uh, 100, um, 100, of answer, and you have all the information. You can also uh, ask, for example, for Austria data or for, uh, I don't know, Croatia result in this item, and you can choose male and female. So you have all the information information collected. That's something that you can do not only for uh, the substances, for example, uh, uh, cannabis, and you will find all, maybe you will find, okay, it works, um, all the items related with the word cannabis, but also with other, um, for example, availability. See? You, we will find all the, uh, the, the, the item related to this topic. For the viability, we found 25 results. Exactly in the, in the same way. It's very simple, it's a descriptive level, but it's something that I never found in other uh, studies. So it's something that make all the data really, really usable for all the people. Then you can move to the third level, but it's a level that uh, requires much more knowledge about the, uh, the ASPAD questionnaire because you here you can organize your analysis. Of course, we are always talking about uh, descriptive analysis, but let me show you, for example, for cannabis, you find all the indicator related uh, uh, the cannabis. And here, for example, we can put an indicator cannabis lifetime and uh, ta-da! you have the uh, information that uh, is not exactly what I attended, but it's the, the, the good part of the Okay, here, uh, as you can see, you have uh, the uh, number of occasions for the cannabis, but we can hide the uh, zero occasion that normally is the uh, uh, bar in the uh, graph. And here you have the distribution of the occasion of the cannabis use in the lifetime. But I'm not happy only with this information, for example, and I want to see this information for all years uh, selected. So I can compare what was going on in all here uh, that we analyze but I'm not happy either with this information. And I want to uh, choose only one country, for example, Italy, because it's something that is easy for me. And here I have data from Italy. That's not the best way to show this. So I will change it and I will put uh, ears on the bar and I will um, show another indicator that is the prevalence rate. Then I don't want the bar, but I want the line and ta-da! Here I have another graph that is the trend for the uh, cannabis use in Italy, but I, uh, I want to uh, add another country, for example, uh, let me put uh, Ukraine. And here I have the trend for Italy and the trend from Ukraine. I can have another um, substance, for example. Let me see tobacco, if I want to see the relationship between the uh, tobacco use, cigarette use. And here, let me find uh, for example, here I have all the e-cigarette is up. First the cigarette, e cigarette, risk cigarette, down, down is not. Uh, mm -hmm. How many occasions smoke a cigarette? How many occasions smoke a cigarette here? And here I can compare the uh, cigarette use with the um, cannabis uh, use in Italy and in uh, Ukraine. But uh, if not, I'm not happy with this, I can also put the gender. 
And here I have too many, uh, let me leave the old series, too many lines. So I'm going to split the chart by gender, for example. So that's something that we can do easily. And at the very end, I can save my research with the name, the classic Italian name for save something is people. And when I go back in the uh, in the in, in this area where I have to log in because I can uh, I can uh, um, register all uh, my research, I will find back all the uh, information that I already collected. That's just a taste of the web portal. I'm here for all your uh, questions and I hope you will enjoy. That's uh, um, easily uh, reachable uh, through the uh, ESPAD portal that is uh, www.espad.org. So you will find everything. You can go in and enjoy all the ESPAD information. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for the little presentation. I'm very happy that uh, the portal is live and kicking. And I remind you, data.espa.org, if you want to access it. Uh, I publicly want to really thank Sabrina and, and her team, Elisa, Sonia, Loredan, and all the colleagues involved in developing the tool, but also my colleagues here, David, Sonia, Silke, Rosemary, Kathy, putting, helping and putting out the, the news release and the communication on the portal. So, uh, we will move to the third uh, question with the two last speakers of this morning. And uh, it, it touches a bit on uh, the ESPA data. So how ESPA data can be used for interventions and also how virtual reality can influence social norms. And I will ask Stephanie and uh, Christian to, to present. So the floor is yours. And uh, again, Questions, do not forget in the QA and, and chat, and we will share with the speakers afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raw, for the nice introduction, also Alexis. Um, I want to present today um, findings uh, about using ESPAD data for guiding substance use prevention. And some of the findings that you will see here, you can probably do also with a data tool, which was very impressive. Thank you, Sabrina, for, uh, for this presentation. And first of all, I want to start with the basis for uh, substance use prevention and we'll tell you a little bit more about factors that are associated with alcohol um, use and cannabis use among European school students. And um, we conducted an uh, analysis and published this analysis in 2021. Here you can see also my co-authors, among others, Joao and other colleagues from EMCDDA, and also a statistician from the Leibniz Institute of Prevention Research and Epidemiology in Bremen. And uh, thanks again for the nice collaborative work. And um, you can find, I think, the, uh, the um, publication already in the comments. So if you want to have a deeper look in it, um, just go ahead. And But first I want to start uh, looking deeply at substance use prevention, um, because I think most of you know that accumulating evidence is showing us that the initiation of substance use early in life uh, con contributes to high levels of use and abuse later in life. So, of course, substance use prevention is, is, is important, but what does substance use prevention mean? And uh, for many people, prevention still means just informing about risks and dangers of behaviors or of substances. And uh, this information alone is not sufficient. And there's um, many students that already show us uh, that they um, such campaign can even encourage drug use, or they showed that students um, were more curious about using drugs after such campaigns. So it's very important that we get a, need, uh, a greater understanding of factors that are associated with licit and illicit substance use to develop and um, evaluate effective prevention approaches. Um, and uh, for that, we um, did uh, analysis of ESPAD data from 2011, and we uh, analyzed data of 26 participating EU countries. As you can see, I think uh, Sabrina um, showed it before, it were not all of the participating countries, but not all of them included the data that we were interested in. And we had a look at two outcome variables that were proxies for us for risky substance use. Um, and we included 
drinking to drunkenness in the last 30 days that you can see on the left side and also uh, using cannabis or use cannabis during the last 12 months on the right side. And um, the different time spans just, um, they, um, we just choose, uh, or they were just chosen because the illicit substance use was um, considerably higher than the illicit substance use. And then we wanted to see which possible factors are associated with substance use. And we looked at three different levels. We looked at the contextual level, the social level and the behavioral level. And we included factors such as perceived rules, peer substance use, or school performance. Not all of these factors can be tackled by intervention, but most of them, or some of them. So this could be very interesting, but all of them can inform, um, uh, can inform interventions um, or preventive interventions. So, and first of all, I want to show you the um, data from 2011 in regard to the risky substance use behavior. And we found that the risky substance use behavior was not the behavior of the majority. So most of the um, uh, school students did not drink to drunkenness in the last 30 days. And most of the school students did not use cannabis in the last 12 months. However, there were considerably higher numbers. Uh, you can see in Denmark, 36.6% uh, of the um, students uh, reported drinking to drunkenness in the last 30 days. And in France, um, 30, 35% of the um, participating school students uh, reported that they used cannabis in the last 12 months. So there's a lot of uh, potential I, uh, I can see for the um, preventive interventions. And for this, we conducted binary logistic regressions. Don't think about the term, but we wanted to find out which factors are associated with the, um, with the risky substance use behavior. And here you can see um, on the left side that, th that this is the most important variable that we can put found in our model. And this is the perceived uh, substance use of friends. So we asked them how, um, how many of your friends uh, get drunk. And if, you, if they report that all of their uh, friends get drunk or drink to drunkenness, or if they perceive that most of their friends or all of their friends drink to drunkenness, they have a 18 times higher likelihood to drink to drunkenness on their own. So this was a striking result. But also other factors are associated with substance use or with uh, drink to dr drinking to drunkenness in this regard. Uh, parental support, adherence to rules, but also school performance. And we repeated this model as well uh, in regard to uh, cannabis use. And we found there again that the perceived norms were very, very important. And we found an, an odds ratio that I've never seen before in my uh, research career of 97. Um, so it, it means if they perceive that all of their friends use cannabis, they have a 97 times higher likelihood to uh, use cannabis on their own. So I think this is a very important. And this, these findings can inform our preventive campaigns that we include this uh, information in uh, yeah in um, in prevention so as um, um, social factors are of importance for sub substance substance we think and higher perceptions of peer use and parental care for example were associated um, with own substance use and I think ESPAD provides a very nice database for the planning of interventions uh, or preventive interventions and should be used uh, more often in the future. And now my colleague uh, Christiane will um, continue and tell you about um, interventions that were based on these uh, findings. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, uh, for uh, this introduction. So you have now already learned how important the social influence is. And uh, I would like to introduce you into two uh, studies, two intervention studies uh, that try to influence social norms and another one uh, that uh, tries to build uh, um, resistance skills and refusal skills with the use of virtual reality with new media. So this, uh, these two studies have been conducted in Denmark at the University of Southern Denmark. I'm also aff affiliated with together with uh, quite many colleagues and uh, have been um, um, supported by the Danish uh, Truk Foundation. 
so in the uh, social norms study, uh, the intervention's name is the good life in Danish, the good life. Um, and we developed social norms messages and uh, they were based on the self-reported data of school um, adolescents on alcohol use and other drugs. Uh, we highlighted in this intervention the difference, the di discrepancy between the perceived norms because adolescents often overestimate uh, what others do as risky behavior. And we um, show them that the actual reported norms are often much lower. Uh, so our intervention and the whole campaign focus on positive and factual behavior among peers. Um, and the messages were tailored for each grade and school because we know that only then social norms messages are relevant for adolescents if they really can identify with the information given. Uh, so uh, the intervention consisted of a session in the classroom uh, in addition with posters and a web application. And the overall duration of the intervention was uh, four to six weeks at each school and grade. Um, so how did the intervention, the social norms intervention look like? It had actually three components. Uh, the first component was a quiz in the classroom where they should guess uh, what their peers are doing. Uh, and then they, uh, they received the actual in the same grade measured percentage, like 74% uh, do not drink. Uh, and this component was then, um, um, in addition, we had uh, then the posters that were hang up at schools uh, in the classroom, but also on the floors. Uh, and they looked like this. They were quite appealing to the kids. And uh, they had also social norms messages, like seven out of 10 pupils in ninth grade at Nesby school have never been drunk. So it always put the positive, the moderate behavior uh, in the center. and. Um, in addition, we had also a quiz uh, that they could download uh, on their smartphones, which actually uh, had basically the same kind of messages, but and they could get guess the right answer. But uh, Alexis uh, Gustil also said it is very important to measure whether uh, the interventions are effective. So we did an evaluation and the objective here was to study and investigate if this intervention was able to reduce the misperceptions like the overestimation of peer alcohol and drug consumption. Um, in this age range of 13 to 17 year old Danish adolescents. Uh, we did this in a randomized control trial where the schools were randomized um, and we had a baseline data collection and a three month follow up. And in between in the intervention schools, uh, the, the program was run and we uh, measured the effect on three different outcomes, whether it was able to reduce the overestimation, whether it was able to reduce the frequent binge drinking. As Stephanie has pointed out, this is a major pro problem in Denmark um, and whether uh, the intervention is successful in reducing alcohol related harms. So uh, in short, uh, the uh, effects of the intervention were that the overestimation like the attitude change was uh, quite successful in the intervention school. The overestimation was um, um, significantly reduced um, and the alcohol related harms uh, were significantly reported uh, to a lower degree. We did not find um, a significant effect on frequent binge drinking, though that was also what uh, Alexis already pointed out uh, from uh, our prevention interventions. We cannot expect that each and everyone changes behavior uh, right away. 
However, we found uh, actually also a reduced drinking in a subgroup of pupils, and that were those who had the intention uh, to drink more, were motivated to drink more in the future. Um, what we also learned uh, from our uh, study was, and I will show you these slides in a minute, uh, that the more uh, intervention dose, the better. The conclusion of the um, outcome evaluation was that receiving the good life intervention had a positive effect on norm perceptions and um, frequent binge thinking was only changed among uh, those um, with motivation to drink more. Our main message is that the social norms intervention have the potential to decrease norm perceptions of peer drinking. Um, so what we also learned from this uh, um, uh, program and uh, the evaluation of it was uh, that um, not all pupils actually saw the uh, posters, it was only half of them, and not all used the web application. But um, the um, vast majority took part in the uh, feedback session. So this classroom session was very important for uh, the um, program. We also saw that uh, most of the students liked uh, the uh, all three components. And that was also a very important finding here. Um, and what we could also see from our study was that it is when doing social norms interventions, it's very important to have a sufficient dose. So uh, because the effect was larger among those who received all three uh, intervention components, and it was also um, larger among those with the high satisfaction who liked the intervention more and those who could uh, recall the social norms messages better. We could not see a dose effect relationship with posters, but we know uh, that the posters uh, have been very Im um, important for the overall success of the program. So uh, to conclude, uh, the participation in our program was highest for the feedback session and lowest for the web app. However, students had overall positive ratings regarding all three intervention components and a high dose of the intervention, high satisfaction and high recall of the social norms messages enhanced the effectiveness of this program, The Good Life. I would like now to briefly touch upon a new project uh, which is using new technology. It's called VR Fast Lab because uh, it aims um, to um, achieve better re resilience to social pressures among uh, Danish and we have also a German component adolescents. Um, so the objective was to develop a virtual reality a training tool, and um, we wanted to use also an empowerment-based living lab approach to co-produce this uh, game, this simulation together with adolescents. We developed it th therefore not uh, very quick, but it was through a series of workshops with, um, together with young people. Uh, and uh, the group consisted of young people, of game developers, video production experts, but also, of course, pre prevention practitioners uh, that are in the field in the schools and with public health experts. Uh, so we uh, developed a prototype um, and it is now um, an app that can be downloaded uh, on a smartphone and that consists of a virtual party simulation where the player can steer his or her own party experience through a series of active choices which are controlled by eye movement. And throughout the simulation, the player is presented to different party scenes and is offered drinks, either alcoholic or soft drinks, but the user can also experience the consequences as shown here in the um, 
in the middle uh, picture of alcohol consumption, but also can engage in other fun things than drinking alcohol, um, like flirting or dancing, and will receive social feedback. Again, the social influence component is also embedded in this game uh, the next morning. Um, so we had a very uh, quick uh, user testing with it, and you can see here that the overall user feedback was quite positive. Most uh, liked the game and would like to explore it uh, further. But of course, we need uh, more research um, on this tool. So um, we have learned already that new technologies such as virtual reality are attractive for pupils. We think it could be a door opener for other alcohol prevention components in this um, age group. And it may be a helpful component also for multi-component interventions uh, for the prevention of substance use. But as I said, more research in this new field is definitely needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christian and Stephanie. We're still seeing a black screen. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. I think it was uh, very interesting and also for me quite new, this bit on uh, virtual reality and how this can be used uh, for prevention. I think with the four speakers, we did like a, a full uh, circle, like we started with the who, so who are we talking about when we talk about young people nowadays, then the how, how do we find out their characteristics, uh, what they, they do, if they use drugs, if they use alcohol, if they don't, and, uh, and for what are we collecting the data for? So how can we use better data for better interventions and better uh, public uh, health policies? So now it's uh, time for questions from the audience. I, I've seen there are some, but please please feel free to, to write them down as well. I see a lot of congratulations in the chat, so that's for the speakers. I see one question, is the SPAD data portal going to be available in other languages? Um, I find, the, I, I guess the spotlights are on, on us on this one. Um, I think as a policy, which we are trying to have products more and more translated in different uh, languages, uh, we haven't discussed internally and with um, the SPAT coordination about having it available in other languages. So I think one step at a time. Now we published it today. I think we we will discuss this and see if it's if it's feasible because it's quite a, a complex tool with a lot of information in the background. But on the other hand, we have all the information translated by the countries in the national languages. So all the, the SPAD questionnaires. So let's see. I, I don't want to commit because technically I don't know how easy and feasible it is, but we will look into it. I would say, Joao, that is an interesting question that let us understand that there is a, an interest, an appetite interest. for having this yeah. transmitted in more languages. And then there is another question, as I suspect the director is still with us, would be nice he also uh, read the question. And it is about the possible use of this platform or inspiration from this platform for our data, for our statistical bulletin. Uh, I think again, is a nice uh, suggestion. I don't know, Alexis, if you feel you can comment on this, uh, on this suggestion. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, once more, congratulations for the presentations. Uh, and, and regarding the two questions, actually, I, I think, uh, Joan, you are totally right. Uh, that is certainly something we would we would be ready to do. We need to discuss with the, the partners and colleagues of uh, SPAD, of course. We need also to see technically how, how we can achieve this uh, at, a, at also an affordable cost. Uh, but certainly the, this should be done because one of the challenges we, we face uh, for everything we do at EMCDB, actually not only in the cooperation with SPAD, sorry, is that the majority of people um, uh, who are working on the field, they, they are not fluent in English. Uh, so certainly there is no way to make those data 
uh, reaching uh, most of the people who would benefit from it if uh, the, the information is available only in English. Now, the advantage of the, the data of, uh, of SPAD is that we talk about data. So the constraints about text are not the same, obviously, than when we have uh, dedicated sections of our, our, on our website. Uh, but still, um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a bit like the smartphones. Uh, you get a smartphone that is not in your language until you find where you can find the comment to change the language or to try to understand. Sometimes you may lose some time. And we talk about some things that people know by heart and don't need to know almost to read where they need to click. So still uh, for SPAD, uh, I certainly would welcome the ID. We, we need to explore the feasibility, but certainly I'm, I'm happy to support the ID and to explore the feasibility together with SPAD. For, for the, the statistical bulletin, yes, of course, uh, uh, something I did not mention, because actually that's not the topic of the day, is that uh, uh, a new business model uh, was proposed uh, and was adopted by your management board last December. The objective is uh, to transform the MCDD into a more customer-centric organization. And uh, the way in which we, in which we reach the objective is to in transforming the EMCDDA uh, and all the wealth of information uh, it uh, it uh, has into a, a digital ecosystem over the next three to five years. Uh, we are actually uh, working on preparing the next step for the implementation. Uh, we have uh, well, we have many priorities, but I would say that the two may the two legs of the of the work and the 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 travel we have to do together are first uh, customers' needs, uh, because to be customer centric means that uh, to produce data or to collect data for the sake of collecting data is not anymore an objective per se. It was the case 25 years ago, because 25 years ago there were no data available at all on the drug situation. So the needs have changed. This is why we need to adapt our offer. And also uh, over the time, uh, we, we have uh, been moving from being an information hub and transforming ourselves into a service provider. So certainly, uh, and the second pillar is, uh, is a data foundation. Uh, and, and we need to, to continue the voyage, the travel, uh, using those two main legs, which is one, understanding better what are the needs of our key customers, and then to see what are the, the data or the analysis that we need in order to, to help them to find an answer to those questions. Uh, and this is why uh, data, the work on data foundation and the work on customers' needs and services to customers uh, will continue to evolve uh, in parallel uh, at the center. Uh, and, and I think there is a, uh, I can say there is a lot of work that is developed by Joan and by uh, the other scientific colleagues in order to streamline, to improve uh, the data definitions, the metadata, the, the way we can uh, have uh, queries and the way we, we may, can make them available. Because I think the, the, the very nice demonstration made by Sabrina, uh, what, what it shows that uh, uh, data should be able to be extracted easily, which is not that easy to make possible. And I think uh, Sabrina, had not too much time, but she was quite eloquent in explaining that it has been a long effort. Um, and and the second the second thing is that uh, we 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 need also to assess what are uh, what are the ways we can help to visualize the data that makes sense. We have been making a lot of uh, work and effort in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, the last two three years we have doing certainly uh, there was an acceleration of our analysis of what are the technical uh, needs, the issues, but also the potential. We have developed a lot of uh, new dashboards, but now we we need to make this available exactly, I think, in line with the questions that was asked. Um, we need to make this available through a dynamic interface. And the, the last word I, I can say on this for today, we can have a, a webinar maybe one day about the needs of our customers, for instance. Uh, but but I, I think the, the main difference is uh, when we were established 25 or 30 years ago, 
the objective was to answer to the question how many how much and we needed to create and invent data to answer to that question today there are much more questions before the way to communicate to answer to this question was through reports and through a statistical bulletin and through a first uh, first generation of website uh, which means in that time communication was publishing today communication means interaction and this is why we have uh, uh, we have done the preparatory work and we we tabled the proposal to our management board to completely change the business model of the center to make this interaction with our partners who are at the same time providers and customers uh, to make it even more agile and more useful in the community. Thank you, Alexis. We have a couple more questions. This one is to Sabrina. ESPAD is every four years. Is it long period? Every two years will be better or what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be better, but it would be very hard to do. So uh, we put together data from 40 countries and we have to homogenize the data collection and the methodology. It's not easy because the ESPAD is a volunteer um, network. That means that people have to collect the data from themselves and then someone voluntarily with the help, with the help of the MCDDA, of course, have to put together the data and uh, it's it's a good uh, it's a good study, but uh, four years uh, is enough for the moment. Maybe in the future, if it will be an indicator, and uh, we will find a way to do it in a much more structured way. Maybe when we will move in the uh, web administrated data collection, it would be easy. But for the moment, four years is the, the best that we can do. Thank you, Sabrina. Yeah, from, from our side, I can confirm that uh, it's it's uh, working with, I think, now 40 countries. It, it's it's a long process. So every four years, I think, at the moment, this is the most feasible option. Uh, to Christian, there is a particular interest on uh, the virtual reality component. Have you explored developing this tool for other diseases areas related to changing behavior to address harms related to substance use or other lifestyle choices, like, for example, fat? liver disease? No, I personally did not, but of course uh, virtual reality is widely used uh, already in, um, in psychological treatment, especially in terms of uh, anxiety treatment. Um, I myself uh, have also considered to using it uh, for, for instance, a sexual um, behavior and in the in the sphere of sexual health. So uh, that was also an idea, but I haven't explored it uh, further yet. Thank you, Christian. I saw that you also pasted some links in the chat for those that uh, were asking for references. Exactly, yes. And uh, we got several uh, participants asking for the PowerPoints. We will be making this uh, webinar available on our YouTube channel, so everything will be public quite soon after some editing work. I'm just checking if there are more questions left. We are also reaching our time. Marika, do you see anything else that I missed? Yes, no, just a comment. I saw that uh, Sabrina smartly is shown us the data on Ukraine. Um, as we are working on some preparedness uh, recommendations from the countries, for the countries receiving uh, Ukrainian uh, displaced people, I think that this data you, you depicted can also be useful to check because up to now, we know that people, male, adult male, cannot leave the country, but this does not apply to the young people. So probably we need to study better your data to be able to provide some help to the younger people that can uh, be joining the at least the neighboring countries, if not the, the head of Europe. So one more useful application. Um, 
I think Alexis has already given a lot of input to the webinar, but there is a tradition that is uh, the one concluding <laughs> in general. I don't know if Alexis, you feel you would like to, to add something. You are always very generous with your contribution to our work. We really appreciate. Um, Thank you, Marika. I think I've been listening carefully to, to the speaker. So first of all, I would like to, to thank you all. This was uh, very interesting, very useful. It was, uh, each presentation was different, which is an advantage because they were complementary and they, they gave different uh, perspectives and highlights. Uh, one, one of the things, uh, I, I, I will not comment more uh, how, how uh, pleased I am uh, to see the the, the new uh, the, the new way to make available the the DSP data I think that's really extremely important uh, milestone so congratulations to Sabrina and the colleagues congratulations to my staff who made possible this uh, also cooperation from our side and we certainly have even more work to do together in the future uh, I, I wanted to highlight just a few words or terms or concepts that are nothing new for those of you who are who know this even better than me, but that, that I think that are a few points interesting to make. Um, just telling you what I would keep in mind when I'm leaving this webinar. Uh, so, so what what uh, what I think was a. Uh, uh, it's always very interesting when people who work on data, like uh, Margarida said, we are not going to start uh, presenting data. I, I think that's a good way to start the discussion, uh, because uh, as it was shown also by Stephanie and Christian. The, the point is uh, we, we, we should start from the questions. And, and, and sometimes, and I think uh, uh, both the, the presentation from Margarida, but also from uh, Stephanie and Christian, have very, very well reflected that uh, not only as I learned in my uh, courses of uh, uh, methodology in statistics at the university, every start, everything starts and has to start with the question. Uh, and, and then the second thing that is even more important is that uh, uh, sometimes we need to remind ourselves or some partners or some decision makers that in the best case scenario, at least uh, traditional statistics make only possible for you to conclude that the, the hypothesis is not wrong. So we are not uh, talking about absolute truth. And this leads me to the third point, which is very well highlighted uh, uh, by those presentations is the fact that what is even more interesting is uh, maybe not to try to prove at any cost that something was successful. Okay, we all wish and hope it has not been a complete failure, uh, even though sometimes we learn more from failure than, than from successes. But it's also the fact that uh, 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 from all the research and use of the data that was presented today, we see there are new questions coming. And I think that's, that, that's really proper to what we can call scientific evidence and scientific work. Uh, I, do, I have a friend who's a professor in neurobiology at the university and, uh, and um, he was already professor for 20 years when we met and discussed uh, for the first time those things. And I remember he, I was very surprised. I was a young psychologist at that time, uh, still uh, extremely faithful in the power of science. And then he was telling me that basically the more he knew, the less he knew, uh, the more he realized that we knew so little. Uh, and therefore to, to remind and refresh the minds about that is very important. And, and this is why I think the, the, the different experiences and research uh, presented today are a very good illustration. Um, really, that's, that's very, was very nice to to get the reminder that when we speak about youth, there is not one youth that's the same everywhere for everybody uh, at the same time. So it also means that when we say we need to move research or transform research into action, it's not only one type of action in one single place at a unique time. Uh, and I think you, each of you, you gave uh, some, some interesting examples. Uh, what, what I found also interesting, it was the reference to to, to the intergenerational approach, uh, which means not only individual or school or family, uh, which I think is very important. There was a reference to mental health issues that are uh, increasingly becoming problematic uh, with the impact of COVID that is still a bit underestimated, I think, uh, but also 
with the, uh, as Margarita mentioned, the importance of environment. Uh, and, and again, uh, and I think also the, the, the presentation from Stephanie and Christian was very interesting with this new project of virtual reality. It, it's that uh, one thing is to try to, to, to influence, to have an influence on behaviors, but also it's also equally important uh, to make available some support, something concrete in the environment. If it, it is only to speak to people about something, obviously the likely long-term impact is more difficult to guarantee and even to assess. Uh, and and um, it reflects also, the, it's an echo to what we have been told uh, two years ago in one of the first webinars we organized uh, during the first uh, COVID uh, uh, lockdown, which, which is the fact that uh, many professionals from the field told us how important it was to keep, to maintain, and to develop more inclusive policies. That what allowed to be useful for some of the interventions during the COVID pandemic and during the lockdown in some countries was not so much or not only the fact that there were some specialized services for addictive behaviors, but also social services, medical services. And that it's uh, only together that in some cases they managed to innovate and to provide the new responses to emerging new needs and problems. So I really love the prevent, protect, promote, participate uh, overview. And to finish, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, the, the reflection about uh, and the, the research on the social norms and the uh, perceptions is, uh, is very in interesting and important too, because that's one of the things that uh, usually is is not really taken into account, or at least not really uh, well understood. And, uh, and I think your example was very good. It, re it reminded me a few other examples in some other EU member states than those who have been involved in that project, in which, for instance, the, 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 the fact that the, 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 the prevalence in cannabis use was so high uh, or had become so high had also in turn an impact on, on the social perception. So in some cases, the social perception may be kind of uh, overestimated the importance of the new perceptions or new attitudes. Sometimes it's the contrary, it's the increase in the, in the consumption, for instance, the increase in the prevalence that can give the impression that now it's mainstream, so it's normal. So maybe I should do, I should continue. And I can tell you that when this happened, we were discussing in a meeting of the national drug coordinators I think more or less 10 years ago, that some decision makers and also we at EMCDDA, we had to question ourselves and say, mm, those of us who were thinking or sometimes saying that, uh, well, cannabis use was maybe not so harmful or so dangerous because uh, likely to have uh, less negative impact than hard drugs, as they were called uh, 15 or 20 years ago. When you see the, the, the concentration in THC, the potency has doubled in the last 10 years. Obviously, we, we were led to inter interrogate ourselves and wonder, maybe we, we kind of, in, un unfortunately and unwillingly, encourage this change in the perception or this wrong social perception that it was not so serious or not such a problem uh, and that this has maybe also contributed to a social perception that that became uh, uh, different uh, and that uh, was giving the false impression that uh, but finally that's normal. And if you want to be normal and mainstream, you should also use. So so I think that this move, uh, this uh, this cycle of uh, getting some analysis, some information, starting from a question, understanding that in fact it. it uh, it creates or, or causes some new questions to occur uh, to our mind and to, to try to design a way to better find a response. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. It was given to us today, starting from the ESPAD school surveys. I think the, the effort to make those data available uh, is, really, is, is really important. I can promise we are going to, to see together with the ESPAD uh, uh, coordination uh, and the partners, uh, how it would be possible to make it available in more languages in the future. But I, I think it's a, it's extremely important. And um, that's a very concrete and very useful uh, contribution to show what means scientific evidence 
and how can we use scientific evidence in our work and and knowing that this also implies modesty and humility in our work and in the way we present the results because i think that's the really scientific approach so that was a fantastic example um, and I, I certainly will leave this meeting uh, encouraged and stimulated to continue or, or travel towards uh, an even more useful EMCDDA, including the different communities of practice around the center. So once more, thank you very much. Thank you to you, Alexis. Always a great contributions and commitment <laughs> to, to the work. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank everybody. We don't add any more words to the conclusion, conclusive remarks by the director. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you, Christiane. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to uh, Margarida Matos, who had to leave before because she had a lesson. Thank you to my colleagues. João Matias and, and Alessandra Bo and all the others that are collaborating to these uh, webinars. I just leave the session open a little bit because it's not nice to expel all the people, but, but you can go. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody.